Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense. This is a playlist called Labs. In the previous video, we have talked about lactic acid, but today we'll talk about lactate dehydrogenase. What is the function of this enzyme? And more importantly, what is the significance of an elevated serum level of LDH? So let's get started. Whether you eat carbohydrate, proteins, or fat, the end result is acetyl-CoA, which goes into the Krebs cycle in the mitochondria to give you energy called ATP. From glucose to pyruvate is called glycolysis. If you have enough oxygen, pyruvate will become acetyl-CoA, goes to give you tons of energy, which is awesome. But what if I do not have enough oxygen? Hashtag anaerobic glycolysis. Pyruvate will become lactate or lactic acid. This was the story of the last video. So if you have oxygen, aerobic, awesome. I'll give you tons of energy, carbon dioxide and water. But if you don't have oxygen, anaerobic, I'll give you lactate or lactic acid and little ATP. What is the name of the beautiful enzyme that converts pyruvate to lactate or lactate to pyruvate? This is the story of the lactate dehydrogenase enzyme. Where can I find it? In almost every cell in your body. Because at some point your cell might run out of oxygen and we need some backup plans. That was the story of biochemistry. But clinically speaking, why do I care that my LDH level and my blood is high? Here is the story, morning glory. Here is your cell. If this cell dies or ruptures, it's gonna release whatever was inside including the lactate dehydrogenase. So if you see elevated lactate dehydrogenase in my blood, it means that my cells are dying. What's the name of the condition when the cells in my heart are dying? Myocardial infarction. How about the brain? Stroke. My lungs? Pulmonary infarction. My liver? Liver failure. This is part of a series on my YouTube channel called Lab, and please watch these videos in order. Today's video is number 16. As a clinician, why should you care about elevated LDH? Because LDH is found in your heart, red blood cells, reticuloendothelial organs, lungs, kidney, pancreas, placenta, liver, and skeletal muscles. So when LDH is high, one of these doofuses is dying. But hey, medicosis, this is not helpful. Imagine my patient having elevated LDH, and then I'm confronting the patient. Hey, my dear patient, uh, your LDH is high. This could be a myocardial infarction. It could be hemolysis. It could be liver problem, spleen problem, lymph node tumor like lymphoma. It could be a pulmonary disease or pulmonary infarction. It could be kidney failure, kidney infarction or kidney disease, maybe it's pancreatitis, maybe it's an eclampsia, maybe it's preeclampsia, maybe your liver is toast and maybe you are just exercising too hard. This is not helpful. I hear you, my friend, and that's why we need LDH isomers. Not all LDH enzymes are created equal. There are subtypes of the LDH. Example, the heart has LDH1 and LDH2. Red blood cells, 1. How about the reticular endothelial organs, LDH2. The lung has LDH2 and LDH3. Kidney, 4. Pancreas, 4. Placenta, 4. The liver has LDH5, and so do the skeletal muscles. Okay, medicosis, normally, in normal persons, what is the most abundant LDH in the serum? And the answer is, it's LDH2. LDH1, heart, red blood cells, LDH2, heart, lungs, and reticuloendothelial organs, LDH3, lungs, LDH4, kidney, pancreas, and placenta, LDH5, liver, and skeletal muscles. Okay, medicos, so what's the clinical significance of LDH? All right. Heart has LDH1 and LDH2. If both are elevated, especially one, like one has to be higher than two, most of the time, not all the time, this is myocardial infarction. How about red blood cells? They have LDH1. Elevated LDH1 could signify hemolysis. Lungs have two and three. If elevated, this is lung disease. Your kidneys have LDH4. If LDH4 is elevated, this might be kidney disease. Liver. LDH5, liver disease. How about if all of the LDH isomers are elevated in my serum? This is a multi-organ failure. Your life is like a country song. So if all of the LDH isoenzymes are elevated, it's multi-organ failure, such as MINCHF, 
lupus, advanced cancer, preeclampsia or eclampsia. Consider this. Imagine that I have a myocardial infarction and CHF, which is one of the complications of myocardial infarction, by the way. How many hearts do you have? One. What are you, a freaking anatomy professor? I don't care about anatomy. I'm talking clinical right here. I want doctors. You have two hearts. You have a left heart and a right heart. I mean, go to your cardiologist and say, hey, I have a right bundle branch block. Okay. But I have a left button, but no, that's a big deal. They are not the same. What if I have right-sided heart failure? Well, you will have congested neck veins enlarged, congested painful liver and ankle edema. However, left-sided heart failure, the heart cannot receive blood from the lungs. You will end up with pulmonary congestion with crackles, formerly known as gal de la mort, the crackles of death. In left-sided heart failure, you can suffer from cough and hemoptysis. Moreover, if the left side has failed, the aorta does not have any blood. You will suffer from decreased tissue perfusion. And the organ that suffers the most when your heart is not pumping is the kidney. Without a robust perfusion, the kidney is screwed. I mean, remember chronic kidney disease or chronic renal failure. How do you know if it's mild or severe? Oh, it's based on the GFR. And where does the kidney get the GFR from? From the arterial perfusion. How about acute kidney failure? One of the causes of acute kidney failure is pre-renal azotemia caused by heart problem. What is the fifth vital sign? Urine output. What if the urine output of the patient is low? This could be renal failure, including pre-renal azotemia. Just remember, no BP, no PP. If you have hypotension, you might suffer from oliguria or anuria. The moral of the story is the right side of the heart is not the same as the left side of the heart. A heart problem can destroy your liver, your lungs, your kidneys, and other organs. Your life is technically like a country song where everything that can go wrong will. Which reminds me of the old historic forensic pathology joke. Imagine, once upon a time there was an electricity technician who climbed over the light pole to fix it. He received an electric shock, fell down on the ground on his back, then was hit by a 1998 dark blue Ford F-150 pickup. His soul ascended into heavens after being hit by a Boeing 737 airplane. <laughs> Mention the cause of death. <laughs> What I'm trying to say is, uh, stop complaining. Some people have it worse than you. I love you. Myocardial infarction and LDH. Okay, medicosis, my patient has elevated LDH1, which comes from the heart. Does it mean it's MI? Yes, it's po very possible that this is MI. But please remember, this could be hemolysis as well. So LDH1 is specific. But the best thing about LDH1 is that it's very sensitive. A normal LDH1 almost excludes the diagnosis of myocardial infarction. It's more than 95% sensitive. And as you know, if the test is highly sensitive, it rules out the disease. There is another cool thing about LDH. It returns back to normal after about 5 to 10 days. So this can help you diagnose a delayed case of myocardial infarction. Example, hey doc, I had severe central chest pain that radiated to my left arm and my left jaw and my left shoulder. It was like an elephant was sitting on my chest. The pain got worse with exertion and was relieved by rest. I was sweating like a pig and I had the sense of impending doom. Hey patient, when did this happen? Do you have the chest pain today? No, not today. It happened four days ago. Do you think I still have the myocardial infarction? Well, that's a good question. One of the ways to help solve this puzzle is your LDH because it returns back to normal level after five to 10 days. Hey, medicosis, but how about the CKMB? Oh, shut up. CKMB returns back to normal after about two to three days. This is four days. In other words, if CKMB is high, it means that the patient is having a myocardial infarction right now or at the very most two days ago, but not four. But medicosis, I do not need the LDH. I will go with the troponin I because troponin I returns back to normal after 10 to 14 days. Well, that's right. But don't forget that troponins can be elevated in chronic renal failure, heart failure, myopericarditis, pulmonary embolism, cardiac trauma, and sepsis. That's why LDH is also helpful. The more clues you have about the patient's case, the merrier. Now, this ratio is one of the most important ratios in medicine, LDH1 to LDH2 ratio. What is normal? Normally, your LDH2, of course, should be higher than LDH1. About 35% of your total LDH is made of LDH2. So normally, LDH2 is greater than LDH1. If you do the LDH1 to LDH2 ratio, 
of course it's gonna be less than one. But what if I have myocardial infarction? Remember, the heart has LDH1 and 2, but in myocardial infarction, LDH1 will elevate and exceed the level of LDH2. So you will have LDH1 to LDH2 ratio greater than one. So normally two should be greater than one, but if I have myocardial infarction, one is greater than two. In other words, the LDH has flipped. Hmm, this is flipping interesting. Now let me tell you more about the flip. Okay, in Photoshop, flip is not the same as rotate. This is rotate. You rotate it by 90 degrees, 180 degrees, and if you rotate 360, you come back here. But flip is different. You flip horizontally or flip vertically. So this is a flipped kidney, but this is a rotated kidney. Okay, medicosis, we know this and you're not funny. Why are you talking so much? Because on your exam day, you will not remember anything. Just my stupid jokes. They will give you the LDH1 and LDH2. And you will not know what the flip to do. And then you will remember the flip. Other flips in medicine. Situs inversus. Oh, this is when your visceral organs are inverted. In this case, your liver will be on the left side. And your spleen will be on the right side. Also, your heart's apex might be on the right side. But hey, necrosis, like, uh, is my liver supposed to be on the right? Shut up. Another ratio that can flip. Remember the lethicin to sphingomyelin ratio? Yeah. Normally, lethicin should be greater than the sphingomyelin. The ratio should be two or more. But what if I do not have any surfactant? Whoa, if you have no surfactant, you have no lethicin, this ratio can drop to one or even less than one. And that's another flip, which means you could be suffering from a respiratory distress syndrome. In the good old days, which were not so good, there was something called x-ray myelogram. Suppose that you have a patient with a problem in the spinal cord, vertebral canal, spinal canal, etc. How do you diagnose it? You used to inject a dye intrathecally into the patient's spinal cord surroundings and then take a picture using x-ray and then bring all the doctors, all the nurses and even call for the freaking dentist to flip the patient upside down and take another picture. Compare picture number one with picture number two to see if there is any obstruction, leak, etc. And that's why the person who invented the MRI is going straight to heaven. Doctors do not need to flip you anymore. Okay, medicosis, I got you. Normally, LDH2 should be greater than LDH1. But if they flip, that's a myocardial infarction. Yes, but be careful. This could be misleading to understand how, let me explain the difference between absolute terms and relative terms. In my great video about cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2, you can find it in my bleeding and coagulation playlist. I've told you the story about Merck and company and Rofikoxib, also known as Viox. There was a lot of debate and discussion about whether Rifocoxib increases the risk of cardiovascular events such as angina, MI, TIA, stroke, etc. They did two studies and here are the results. If you are a drama queen such as a freaking lawyer or a news media, you'll say, oh, the study have concluded and proved that Rofikoxib quadrupled the patient's risk of a heart attack. A more dramatic way of saying it is, it increases the risk by 400%. This is when you only focus on the relative terms. If you dig deeper into the story, here is what went down. The risk of a cardiovascular event with rofecoxib was about 0.4%. Naproxen, which is the non-selective COX inhibitor, it was just 0.1% risk. In other words, out of every 100 patients taking rofecoxib, 99 of them will not have any problem when it comes to heart attacks. But if you compare this number to this number, oh, it's quadruple, this is a 400% increase, people are dying! And it gets worse, because there was a fallacy in this study known as outcome switching. Here is how it works. Imagine that you have designed a clinical trial to test for hypothesis X. You got two groups, one group will receive the drug, the other one will receive placebo, or something else and then you will conclude whether x is true or not outcome switching however is when you are trying to find x who saw something like y and you said oh let's just report this and conclude this and publish the results this is not a clinical trial this is a banana republic if you want to test for y go back to square one start a new study 
that's trying to prove whether y is true or not because there is something called the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis they have to be set before you start the freaking study you cannot just switch the outcome and publish the result moreover many of these results were not statistically significant not alone clinically significant the difference that you saw between rafikoxib and naproxen was a difference between high dose rafikoxib and a normal dose naproxen and last, this increased risk of cardiovascular event happened only in patients who had a previously very high risk of myocardial infarction. When you take all of these facts into consideration, rofecoxib is not that horrible. And don't forget the reason why people take COX-2 inhibitors to begin with is that they have a chronic pain problem and a peptic ulcer disease for which a non-selective COX inhibitor is a bad choice. That's why they go to silicoxib rofecoxib. But these grudgy details did not matter to lawyers or to the media. The publicity was so bad that Merck took rofecoxib off the market. After taking it off the market, the FDA and the Canadian equivalent of FDA begged them to return it back because the benefits outweigh the risks they still did not. The irony of the irony is there is another company trying to bring rofecoxib back to the market to treat hemophilic arthritis. And last, here is a personal story. My mom had a terrible toothache and it was late at night. The only pain medication available in the house was a freaking COX-2 inhibitor. She asked me, should I take it? I said, yeah, take it. But how about the increased risk of cardiovascular events? I said, you're not taking it forever. You're taking three pills for the tooth pain. Go ahead and take it. Hey, medicosis, how dare you kill your mother? Shut up. The toothache is gone and my mom is fine. There are no solutions in life. There are only trade-offs. There is no such thing as a drug with no side effects. Yes, medications can kill you, but also pain can kill you. It's called the vasovagal reflex. Not to mention the agony, the stress, the loss of productivity, etc. So what are you trying to say, medicosis? I'm just trying to say, don't just focus on the 4x. Try to dig deeper and look at the absolute numbers. Look at both the absolute terms and the relative terms. But what the flip does this have to do with the LDH? Let me tell you. Imagine that you have a patient with pulmonary infarction and chest pain. The patient asked, doctor, do you think I have a heart attack? You looked at LDH2 and it was greater than LDH1. Okay, normal. LDH1 to LDH ratio was less than 1. Fine, that's normal. Hey patient, do not worry about it. You do not have a heart attack. Shut up, you freaking doofus. What did I say? The patient has pulmonary infarction. The lung has what? LDH2 and LDH3. So LDH2 will be high. Even if the patient has myocardial infarction, LDH1 will be high. Still, I can have LDH2 greater than LDH1 with a myocardial infarction. And that's why do not just look at the relative terms, look at the absolute terms as well. What should be the normal LDH1? Well, it should be around 50 international units per liter. Okay, how about this patient's LDH1? Well, it's uh, 150. You freaking doofus. But hey, medicosis, do not judge me. It did not flip. Well, the patient's family are gonna flip your butt in front of the judge and you will end up behind bars. Do not forget to send me your mug shots, anteroposterior and lateral, please. Other causes of elevated LDH1. Well, hemolysis, red blood cells have LDH1. If you remember extravascular hemolysis, here is the splenic macrophage destroying my red blood cell. And what's happening here? LDH is elevated, specifically LDH1. So how do I know there is hemolysis? Three labs, LDH1, elevated. How about unconjugated bilirubin, also elevated but haptoglobin decreased. Intravascular hemolysis, your red blood cell is destroyed inside the vessel. When the red blood cell is destroyed, it releases what? LDH1. LDH1 is high, unconjugate bilirubin, high, haptoglobin, low. Is LDH elevation synonymous with MI? Well, it suggests MI, it's sensitive and it's specific. But the question is, which LDH are you talking about? Well, if it's LDH1, yes. However, hemolysis can also elevate your LDH1, so it could be hemolysis and not MI. Be careful because strenuous exercise can increase your LDH1, 2, and 5. Some drugs can elevate your LDH1, or any LDH for that matter. Here are some examples. Vitamin C can lower your LDH1. So here is a patient with myocardial infarction coming to you. Hey doctor, do you think I have a heart attack? Well, let me look at your LDH1. Well, your LDH1 is fine. You do not have a heart attack. Shut up. Maybe the patient took too much vitamin C. 
which decreases LDH1, giving you a falsely low level of LDH1. Why don't you just take a good history from the patient instead of trying to be house MD? Let me digress for a second and tell you about another story of vitamin C ruining your lab test. Imagine a patient coming in and you suspected hematuria. Okay, I think there is blood in the urine. Let me order some urine dipstick. The urine dipstick is negative because the patient was taking vitamin C. So vitamin C can give you a falsely negative test for hematuria when you do the urine dipstick. So what should I do? Send the urine to the lab. Do not do it on the bedside, just by the urine dipstick. And you can order urine microscopy as well. If you see red blood cells under the microscope, there is red blood cells in the urine. What is the normal LDH serum level? Well, it depends on your age, but for adults, it's between 100 and 190. This is the total LDH. Out of this total, we have the isomers. LDH1 is about uh, 26%. So about one quarter of this. So if you say it's 100, this is normally 25 international units per liter. Serum LDH is elevated in the cases of myocardial infarction, lung problem, hemolysis, kidney problem, gut ischemia, gut infarction, acute pancreatitis, tumors, including lymphoma, and don't forget lupus, and don't forget when your life is like a country, multi-organ failure. All that we have talked about in this video is about serum LDH, but you can measure LDH in the urine. If LDH in the urine is high, this could be urological injury, urological tumor. And there is serosal LDH. What are the serosal cavities? Pleura, pericardium, peritoneum. If you measure LDH here, especially the ratio of LDH inside the effusion to LDH in the serum, it can tell you whether the effusion is a transudate or an exudate. You know the difference between a transudate and an exudate, right? Transudate is spitting, exudate is non pitting. Transudate is dependent, exudate is non dependent. Transudate is caused by increased hydrostatic pressure or decreased oncotic pressure, but exudate is caused by increased capillary permeability. Transudate is just an ultrafiltrate of plasma. This is some clear fluid, but exudate is some gunk. If the effusion LDH is less than 200, this is a transudate, but in exudate, it's greater. Same thing with the exudate to serum LDH ratio, less than 0.6, transudate, more than 0.6, Exudate. But hey, medicosis, um, is there a reason for this? Because like my professor told me it's just the way it is and you have to memorize it this way because in the good old days we used to memorize just like you memorize today. Your professor is a piece of melanin. Of course there is a reason. What is the nature of the transudate? Just fluid. Ultrafiltrate of plasma. Okay, but the exudate fluid and pus. And where did pus come from? Pus cells. What do you mean? Neutrophils. These are what? White blood cells. Say it again. White blood cells cells so they can rupture and release LDH inside the pleural effusion. Yes, and that's why LDH is high, whether in absolute terms or relative terms in the effusion. If this is an exudate, the opposite is true of the transudate. Medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. To learn more about the difference between exudate and transudate and the different types of pleural effusions, watch my video on pleural effusions in my pulmonology playlist. Which test tube should we use to order the serum LDH, the red top tube? In the next video, we'll talk about lactoferrin. If you want to learn more about how do we treat myocardial infarction, arrhythmia, heart failure, hypertension, etc., check out my cardiac pharmacology course on my website, medicosisperfectionalis.com. Tumors can raise your LDH. Learn more about anti-cancer pharmacology by downloading my course on my website. You can also get the pinnacle of all courses, my antibiotics course, talking about antibacterials, antifungals, antivirals, and antiparasitic medications, medicosisperfectionalis.com. And for a limited time, you can get a 30% discount towards anything on my website. Just use discount code SAVE30 at checkout. It's only available for the next nine students. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.